And now it's time for us to discuss more of those headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lena. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? I'm doing very well, chipper as always. <laughs> How are you All doing? All right, I'm doing uh, not too bad. For a Thursday, yeah. pretty decent. Yeah, nearly a week in now. Yeah, I know. Season. Actually, Thursday is actually... Starting to get... Yeah. Um, it's about time we get used to it. And I think, yeah, Thursday, four days in, I'm, I've acclimated, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, one day to go and then it's a full week. And then, you know, it's always from the second week that we used, usually get used to these things. So... Uh, <laughs> Ask me again a week from now, Adam. I will do. I will do. <laughs> All right, let's jump into keyword news. We're going to try to clarify some of these major headlines for you this morning, starting with our COVID-19 coverage. This is our first pick of the day. Half a million cases. So new COVID cases in Korea have surged to yet another record high and has now surpassed more than half a million. Now, what's the latest? Yeah, there were, as you said in the headlines, just uh, under 550,000 new cases as of 9 p.m. yesterday. That's up by more than 100,000 uh, in the space of 24 hours. Uh, now, the daily tally for Seoul also passed the 100,000 mark for the first time as well. Uh, and especially with cases being counted until midnight, um, it's going to jump even further mm -hmm. with today's reported tally as well. Um, cases are expected to jump like this for the time being since uh, rapid antigen tests uh, at local clinics anyway are now counted in the official figure because they are officially counted as cases now. Mm. Uh, 164 more deaths were reported with the fatality rate standing at 0.14. Uh, the number of critically ill patients again reaching another record high of uh, 1,244. There was some confusion as the daily figures from the central and local governments differed slightly, uh, but that was due to some overlapping and erroneous data that appears to have been caused after that new shift to mm -hmm. counting these rapid antigen tests uh, in the official figures. But uh, it seems that issue has been resolved to some extent um, so we'll have to see on what number comes out in today's announcement. All right. Uh, now, despite this very surge, the government is looking to ease standing COVID restrictions with an announcement due tomorrow after that sit down with health experts yesterday. Uh, what can we expect at this point? Right. So the current 11 p.m. business curfew and the six person cap on private gatherings are due to end this Sunday. Uh, Prime Minister Kim Bogan reportedly called for health authorities to start discussing with the medical community about lowering the grade for COVID-19. It's currently classified as a class one infectious disease, which basically calls for high level responses on patients such as negative pressure isolation. Uh, now the process for screening incoming travelers will also be simplified. That is something that has been uh, confirmed. That's happening from next Monday. Uh, all international arrivals are required to submit their health status, such as test results and vaccination statuses, uh, as well as other personal details, in advance online before departure. Uh, and after they do that, a QR code will be sent to the traveller for a quick scan upon arrival to make the process more streamlined and quicker. Mm. Uh, and it'll also be used as proof of a seven-day self-quarantine exemption, mm. something the government is trying to do away with. But the pre-registration system for travellers who were vaccinated overseas and have yet to report vaccination status to Korean authorities will not be open until April 1st. That basically means that those arriving in Incheon this month still have to quarantine for seven days. So if you are planning to come into the country, do bear that in mind if you are uh, part of that group. Um, there are also calls for the private gathering ga uh, cap to be eased to eight and business curfews extended to midnight. That is one of the options that some experts have um, suggested if, the, well, they're really suggesting not to ease them, uh, health experts, but mm. uh, if there is to be a compromise, that is the compromise they're suggesting. Whether that will happen remains to be seen, of course. The announcement comes tomorrow. All right, so we'll have to wait it out until tomorrow. There seems to be a, a great deal of tug of war between health experts and those who want to alleviate these standing social distancing mm -hmm. rules, right? But we'll have to wait and yeah. see, as you've said. Mm -hmm. All right, on to our second keyword of the day. Fed rate hike. Uh, as widely expected, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates Wednesday for the first time since 2018. It's probably the first of many subsequent ones. So what's the latest? 
Yeah, so as you said, it is the first of many subsequent ones. It basically kicks off the Fed's efforts to tackle the country's highest inflation that's come in four decades, basically. Uh, high inflation has been pushing the central bank to pull back on its uh, extraordinary pandemic uh, era support. But since the tide is slowly turning uh, in the US uh, into a re economic recovery stage, um, the Fed is moving. Uh, the key rate was increased by a quarter percentage point, as largely expected, to a target range of between a quarter percentage points and half a percentage point. Mm -hmm. Now, the Fed also forecast six more hikes this year. That's up from the three quarter, uh, three quarter point increases that the Fed officials predicted in December. Uh, and more than the six moves that many top economists predicted this week. Mm. Uh, the Fed forecast another four hikes actually in 2023 as well. Um, on average, Fed policymakers said they expect interest rates to climb to around 1.9% by the end of this year. So that will be quite a jump from the near zero mm. that we've been seeing over there. Uh, the Fed, however, is warning that inflation will not immediately abate in response to its initial interest rate hike. So it's kind of downplaying expectations there. Um, the central bank now projects prices to rise by 4.3% over the course of 2022, well above the 2.6% pace it had projected in December. Um, usually central banks have a target of 2% inflation mostly. Uh, but of course, uh, the times we're living in now is kind of unrealistic to hope for that target. Um, in 2023, the Fed hopes to bring that pace down to about 2.7 percent, and then 2.3 in 2024, and make it slowly uh, calm that calm down. Um, now, the Fed also noted that the economic outlook uh, for the U.S. remains highly uncertain as well, especially with the war in Ukraine happening. <sighs> now, the central bank is walking a tight rope as it needs to kind of tamp down on spending just enough to bring prices under control without tipping the economy into recession. And <laughs> that is a risk of these right. interest rate hikes, right? right, right. Um, yeah, and that balancing act was made especially tougher by Russia's invasion of Ukraine as well, which uh, triggered a sharp jump in the gasoline and grain prices especially. Uh, and Fed policy lowered, uh, policymakers lowered their forecast for economic growth this year to 2.8%. That's down from 4% that was projected in December. All right. And uh, for our next keyword, let's turn to some economic news right here at home in Korea. This is our third keyword of the day. Employment up. So the country has added over 1 million jobs year on year for the second straight month in the month of February. So it's kind of in still the recovery phase of the worst of the pandemic. But give us the details of this latest report. Right. Well, according to Statistics Korea, the number of those employed came in at just over 27,400,000 in February. That's about 1,040,000 from the same month uh, of last year. Uh, the employment growth surpassed 1 million for the second straight month after expanding about 1.1 million in January. Uh, that was also an increase of more than 400,000 jobs compared to January as well. So, uh, And it was the largest on-year increase for any February, in fact, in almost 22 years. Um, now, the rapid increase was mainly attributed to the low base effect. Basically, in February 2021, employment tumbled 473,000 on a yearly basis due to the pandemic. So the starting point was very low, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, the country's employment continued to rise for 12 months since March last year, thanks to the economic recovery driven by uh, solid exports, which have been um, uh, doing quite well during the pandemic. Now, the employment rate for people aged 15 and older rose two percentage points last month to a record high of almost 61 percent. This shows the recovery following the slump in job figures uh, last year. Uh, the number of those unemployed totaled 954,000 in February. That's down nearly 400,000 from a year earlier. Um, and subsequently, the jobless rate shrank one and a half percentage points to 3.4 percent but do take these data with a bit of grain of salt it basically all depends on how you interpret this data uh the question of quality jobs exactly. uh regular and irregular always still mm. um is true when reading such figures exactly and we haven't even talked about well, we haven't had a chance to talk about how much of those jobs are actually put into the market by the government and when the government says yeah. pull out will those jobs be sustainable that's another angle to consider you're right big right. grain of salt exactly on to our fourth keyword of the day 
New Hyundai plant. Hyundai Motor's first manufacturing plant in Indonesia is now open for business as a carmaker eyes expansion, of course, into the Southeast Asian region particularly. Tell us more about the plant itself. Right. So, well, the plant is located in the Delta Mass Industrial complex which, complex, which is about 40 kilometers east of Jakarta. It has started mass production of Hyundai's uh, flagship electric vehicle, the Ionic 5, a uh, flagship for Hyundai, not uh, Genesis, mind you. Um, Hyundai says it's the first EV to be manufactured in the country, in fact, and uh, other models are also in the pipeline over there. Uh, the plant currently has an annual production capacity of 150,000 units a year, but Hyundai plans to invest nearly two trillion won, or one and a half billion dollars, to raise that capacity to 250 units a year. Uh, Hyundai Motor Group Chairman Chang Yisun said during the opening ceremony over there that Indonesia is a key hub for Hyundai's future mobility strategy. He added that Hyundai will keep contributing to the establishment of the EV ecosystem in Indonesia uh, Mm -hmm. through synergies with the battery plant that the firm is actually currently developing. Mm Hyundai is working with uh, LG Energy Solution to build a battery cell factory in Karawang Mm -hmm. with the target uh, to start production in 2024. Uh, The Indonesian president, Joko Widodo, was also at the ceremony and he looked forward to the plant being a manufacturing, uh, making Indonesia a manufacturing hub to realize this country's EV ambition. Um, and Hyundai wants basically to aggressively expand its presence in the Southeast Asian market. Uh, funnily enough, Indonesia is actually the only country in Southeast Asia where Hyundai has a plant. Uh, others are in you know, China and the US mm-hmm. and the Czech Republic and Europe as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and they want to surpass the Japanese automakers, which are currently enjoying the most uh, market share of over 70%. In fact. <laughs> That's an overwhelming majority of the market. And to share that pie, Hyundai Motors. Mm-hmm. On to our fifth keyword of the day. Failed launch. Uh, As it was widely reported, North Korea fired an apparent ballistic missile yesterday, but the launch appears to have ended in a failure with further analysis on the way. What's the latest? Right. So all this comes after days of close monitoring by Seoul and Washington, which we reported on in anticipation of a possible ICBM test. Uh, Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff say the projectile was launched from Pyongyang's Sunan district. Now, this Sunan airfield was the site of test launches back in February and uh, uh, March as well. We don't know yet uh, if Wednesday's launch involved the same kind of projectile as the previous two launches, but there is a a strong possibility. Uh, A South Korean military official requesting anonymity said the projectile appears to have exploded in midair at an altitude of below 20 kilometers, And the official said the cause of the explosion wasn't uh, yet known. Details are a bit scarce at the moment. Um, Watchers believe the missile likely exploded less than a minute after the launch. But again, no confirmation of that. Now, this latest launch is the North's 10th kind of uh, this year. Mm. Um, And of course, bringing condemnation again from both Seoul and Washington. Some experts believe that Pyongyang seems to be taking advantage of the current confrontation, in fact, between uh, the US and Russia over Ukraine, as it offers the best chance for its uh, new ICBM test without worrying too much about tougher sanctions because mm-hmm. the kind of the spotlight is over Shifted, there at yeah. the moment. Yeah. And uh, deterring US uh, Russia relations could also mean that Moscow was unlikely to agree further two further U.S. sanctions against North Korea, even if an ICBM was fully launched to its full range Mm. or another nuclear test even was conducted. So Russia will more likely veto any sanctions that go through the UNSC. Um, It is also unlikely the latest failure will actually deter the North as well. Mm. Kim Jong-un has a a huge wish list list of weapons uh, that he will likely press ahead with, especially as he's looking looking for a win, a success in his 10th year uh, in charge of the country. All right, and on to our last keyword of the day. Japan earthquake. A powerful earthquake has hit the same region where a major earthquake triggered the Fukushima nuclear disaster 11 years ago. What's the latest? Right, well, the latest is that one person has actually reportedly died due to the tremors, and dozens of people are believed to have been injured. Uh, Reports suggest the magnitude of 7.3 tremor was too forceful for people to stand, and buildings rattled in the capital Tokyo as well. Uh, Aftershocks were said to be possible in Fukushima, Miyagi, and Yamagata prefectures. 
Um, immediately after the event, a tsunami advisory was issued for parts of the northeast coast, but Japanese broadcaster NHK is now reporting that it has been uh, withdrawn. Now, more than 2 million homes were without electricity in 14 northeastern prefectures, including the Tokyo region. Uh, a bullet train, actually, north of Fukushima City was also derailed by the quake, but there were no immediate reports of injuries from that incident. Mm. Uh, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has told uh, reporters that the government was still trying to assess the extent of any damage. Um, and, uh, of course, what's been concerning is that the tremor was recorded not that far off the coast of Fukushima, where the uh, Muka meltdowns happened 11 years ago, one of the most powerful earthquakes that happened in Japan, in fact. But uh, nuclear authorities have said that there are no abnormalities uh, that have been detected um, at the damaged Fukushima site or any other nuclear site for that matter. Mm. Uh, but we'll, of course, have to keep our eyes on any updated assessments of the damage that uh, has occurred. Thank you very much, Aaron, for today's coverage. Have a safe day and we'll speak to you again tomorrow. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.